late in the third century, a rich young man named Antoon longed for solitude. Giving up all that he possessed, he journeyed to the heart of the Egyptian desert. For nearly 80 years, he lived the simplest of lives, praying, fasting, and occasionally welcoming visitors. Antoon, or Saint Anthony of the desert, was the father of monasticism, a spiritual father for monks and others who seek peace and quiet with their God. The feverish pace of society has hardly subsided since the time of Antony. Everyone seeks relief, a time to release, recharge, and prepare for the next challenge in life. Monasteries offer a solution for the stressed out American. There are more than 200 monasteries in the United States, and surprisingly, these are places you can visit for a day, a week, or even a lifetime. Jim Murphy leads us on a journey to seven distinct monasteries. The majestic beauty of St. Meinrad Archabbey, a Romanian Orthodox monastery and its icon school. Benedictines in the desert of southern Arizona. A one-of-a-kind Lutheran monastery. Followers of St. Francis of Assisi. An Ozark Mountains Trappist monastery. The community of world-renowned musical artist John Michael Talbot. And we'll conclude our journey with a modern-day St. Anthony, a hermit in northern Ontario, Canada. And then we take the cows. <laughs> Jim Murphy juggles an active life of family, coordinating special events, and authoring. Active in Christian renewal, Jim has visited personally with Pope John Paul II and Mother Teresa of Calcutta. To pray with and for the people of America, he recently walked 4,000 miles across the United States. And so, we seek answers to these questions. Do monks and other religious have a patent on peace? Can you and I find this same solitude? Peace is definitely a characteristic of these kinds of places. Hi, I'm Jim Murphy. Although the lifestyle of those who live in these monasteries may seem a bit unique or even unusual to us, their hearts are filled with warmth and a willingness to share with us some of the greatest mysteries of life. Atop the rolling hills of southern Indiana stands an ancient work of art, St. Meinrad Archabbey. This monastery is home to 140 Benedictine monks. Music, painting, stained glass, sculpture, and architecture combine to create a praying and working community. Well, Jim, I think one of the foundations of Benedictine monasticism 
is that the creation is good. Uh, creation is part of God's work. And creation is given to us not only to enjoy, but also to continue, if you will, to continue that work of God. This is St. Benedict, a 6th century Christian who taught the importance of both praying and working. His teachings have guided monks for 1,500 years. And this is St. Meinrad, a follower of Benedict who is known for his hospitality. In fact, Meinrad was so hospitable that he knowingly fed and lodged the men who would take his life. The teachings and traits of these two saints prayer, work, and hospitality have guided the monks of St. Meinrad Archabbey for nearly 150 years. Visitors are invited to pray with the monks four times daily or spend their time studying, visiting, or resting. The Archabbey is also the headquarters of Abbey Press, world-renowned makers of inspirational products. Well, I originally started coming to St. Meinrad over 20 years ago when I had a friend in seminary here who invited me up. And it had such a profound feeling to me uh, in my soul and in my spirit and such a rejuvenating spirit that I've been coming back ever since. And uh, as newlyweds, I mm -hmm. convinced my new wife to come up here. So now she's a regular as well. I have just felt like it's... It was like the end of a, of a day when you put your briefcase down at home and you take a deep breath. That's how I felt when I came here. I felt like I put all my briefcases down and I could take a deep breath and, and just felt um, cleansed and, and warmed and at home. One of the values, key values, of both Christianity and Benedictine monasticism is that you can find God in the ordinary. You don't have to go up on top of the mountain. You can find God in the world around you. You can find God in the people around you. You can find God in the silence or in the noise of your own heart. Prayer doesn't have to be long. Prayer doesn't have to be dramatic. Prayer can be something as simple as taking two minutes out and saying, who am I, you know, what am I trying to do here? Uh, who is God? I think your first thought is that it's, um, it's, it's almost hyper-religious. Um, maybe only people who are devoted to uh, religion in their daily life, or, like the clergy, should come. But really, it's just the opposite. It kind of helps you center back on those parts of yourself that you don't usually take out and look at in everyday life. We tease that people go to, to Las Vegas together for little mini honeymoons. Now, we go to St. Mindrus. <laughs> It's the middle of winter, and there's a peacock in your pickup. Welcome to Southern Arizona and Holy Trinity Monastery, the home of 379 types of birds, roadrunners, an occasional panther, and a growing community of religious sisters, brothers, and retirees. This is a young monastery founded in 1974 by Father Louis Hassenfuss. How would I describe the place? Well, I would describe it certainly as a Benedictine monastery in the making. Uh, I say in the making because when we traditionally think of Benedictine monasteries, we think of Monte Cassino, or we think of St. Meinrad's Abbey, or St. John's in Collegeville, which are monstrous in size and have a, um, a sense of awe. And their buildings, their architecture and the like would be breathtaking. Um, we're... Uh, uh, anything but breathtaking. Uh, we chose particularly uh, the idea of, of having adobe buildings because uh, adobe has a, a lovely quality in that um, 
if for some reason or another uh, the monastery uh, no longer existed, uh, that it would kind of just melt back into uh, the surroundings. It wouldn't leave a scar. A visit to Holy Trinity Monastery can be a reminder of the fragility of our lives. There is the tranquility of the people that's reflected in the peaceful beauty of nature. Yet the people share a keen awareness of their mortality. Oh, I, I retired. I don't know whether they want my life story or not, but my wife died last August. And I uh, had for some time been interested in monastery life. And so I had heard about Holy Trinity and I came down and fell in love with it and said, this is for me. And I brought my wife down with me and she's interred by the side of the chapel. And there's a space up there for me. And with my wife down here with me, I feel peaceful. I just feel real good. What we do a lot of is uh, retired people in RVs come and um, they have a lot of talents and we use their talents like we built this what you see all this stuff we built a lot of it is volunteer work they love to help us the monastery also serves as an unofficial cultural center for the community there's a museum workshops for the arts and seasonal festivals also on the grounds our library gift shop and thrift shop. And of course, there's lots of time to pray. So what we've developed is uh, the traditional Benedictine way, but we have the charismatic expression, especially in healing and laying of hands. A lot of people that had cancer have come to us, especially little children. We prayed with them and they've gotten healed. I would say that for an individual who feels that they are, say, six or seven inches below the surface of the water, uh, that they're over their head, definitely. Um, that that individual would be able to come here and merely walk um, up to the chapel, uh, the lovely garden entrance into the chapel, to walk around the bird sanctuary, to make the outside stations of the cross, to sit by one of the five little lakes that we have, um, just to look up at the sky, to experience a, a real sense of solitude, this is certainly possible here. A highlight for many Holy Trinity visitors is a Friday evening prayer service called Teze. It's an enlightening time of prayer and contemplation. Teze includes the reading of a gospel passage in various languages. We start off with English and I move into Latin and then we go into German and we go into Spanish and French and, and uh, the Tongan language. But it just shows the universality of God's message and of God's desire that we be a people who enter into meditation and then hopefully move deeper into contemplation. And so we offer an environment in which this can take place.
This is Dormition of the Mother of God Orthodox Monastery here in southern Michigan. It was founded by Romanians and is only about 10 years old. Although the monastery itself is quite new, the form of worship here is ancient. This is a spiritual way since in the desert of this world, a place where you go to rest and uh, renew yourself spiritually. This is my mom's granddaughter, Debbie. Very Debbie, nice to and her dad was Eli. Remember Eli? Yes. yes. But yes the most important thing in this monastery are the services in church, the liturgical cycle in 24 hours. Second are the guests. There is no Orthodox monastery with a, without a guest house. They don't pay anything. It's not a hotel. They come to do what we are doing. They are invited to be exactly as we are. This peaceful setting in Rives Junction, Michigan, is far from Father Roman Braga's homeland, where he and others were persecuted for their religious beliefs. Father Roman was imprisoned in Romania for 11 years. Two of those years were in solitary confinement. His crime, among other things, teaching people about the saints. Ironically, imprisonment became a monastic experience for Father Roman. And I found God there. I'm ashamed to tell you, I was a theologian. I studied my theology, but theology is nothing to be studied. About God, you don't read, you don't make uh, research. God is life. I didn't find God in my heart and, until then. I was still young, 26 years of age. But that solitary confinement was wonderful. When you don't have uh, another perspective, you, there was a little window there, but I couldn't reach it. Uh, you look just the uh, four walls of your room. You have to go somewhere because people is an intellectual journey, okay, but uh, uh, you have to go to, 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 to explore something else. And that's what uh, the moment when I started to explore my inner universe, which is our soul. When you find God in yourself, you don't find only God, you find yourself. Save this and take this part and add some more of this to make it darker so that you can use it for your own. This is Icon School, and these are icons. Icons are the picture story of salvation history. Of course, we call icons as the Word of God in color, in pictures. As we walk in an Orthodox church, we look at the walls and we see the scripture open. All the parables in the Old Testament, the prophets, the saints, the miracles that Christ has performed, they're all there. At one glance, you can see it all. So that the icon becomes a window to, uh, through which you are looking into heaven, channels of communication between man and God. I consider every icon a studio a shop of the Holy Spirit. Typically, the creation of an icon requires months of praying, fasting, and painting. This monastery offers a mini course in iconography, and these students will take home St. Mary Magdalene. Well, whether they've got an art background or not, they can expect, hopefully, with God's help, to finish an icon in about five days uh, of real intense work. You begin with prayer. Painting an icon is a gift from God, and um, 
it's a, a theological undertaking, so prayer is very, very important, not only in starting your work, but while you're working. I really haven't had any art experience. It gives you a, a better idea of the monastic life, I think, because uh, it's one of the things that the monks do here and in other monasteries is paint icons, and I, I wanted to try it out also. It gives you a new respect for icons because you see them and it takes a long time to do one properly. It's God's gift to be able to paint icons and I'm very happy to be able to share it here at the monastery because they give us so much and to be able to give back a little bit, it's really a joy. rhythm of the secular life and the society is not a normal rhythm. A normal rhythm for us is the rhythm of prayer and of church. And it's very typical when they come here that it takes time to unwind, so to say, to quiet down, to become still, body, soul, and mind, and enter the rhythm of the life of the monastery. You discover a whole new world, a whole new person within yourself. This is what we are stressing for people who come to the monastery. I hope that this monastery will become a spiritual center for everybody. In 13th century Italy, a young woman named Claire was captivated by the bizarre behavior of a poor little man named Francis. Francis was known to give beggars the clothes he was wearing, talk to birds, and pray throughout the night. He tried his best to read the Gospels and be like Jesus. Claire was the first woman who decided this way of life was noble. She was a young, beautiful woman of a noble family and she knew that God was calling her to something and when she heard Francis preach that spoke to her so strongly she had a burning desire to be completely poor and for 800 years thousands of women have decided to follow the way of St. Clair Located in farm country near Evansville, Indiana, the Monastery of St. Clair is home to 20 Franciscan Sisters of St. Clair. They spend their days and nights in prayer, but like Francis and Clair, they find time to enjoy the beauty of creation. I do, I love to be out. We get lots of fresh air, lots of good exercise, and sometimes you see results Sometimes you don't. Sometimes I see lots of little red worms, and that makes me very happy because I know they're making good soil. And it's kind of a challenge. In the springtime, you come out and find things that you didn't know would ever come up again. It's sort of like meeting old friends. Now, if any real gardener saw this, you'd say that's murder. Like most monastic communities, the poor players in Evansville have an important outreach. For 100 years, churches throughout the Midwest have relied on these sisters for their communion bread. The material we use is flour and water, nothing else. We don't use any other foreign substance in our, in our baking. No oil, sugar. When we mix uh, for, for a big uh, day's baking, we mix um, 90 pounds of flour in one mixing, and we do that three times. It has to heat up to a certain temperature, otherwise they, they just, they're cold sheets and 
Uh, we have a lot of trouble with the sheets if they're not well baked. But you can overbake them too, you know. So it has to, you, you get a sort of a sense of what's right there, you know, after you bake a while. What's going through your mind when you're making the bread? What's going through my mind is oftentimes uh, a conversation with the Lord, or perhaps just talking one way to Him. Other times, I'm totally devoid of any words and just being with Him. Sometimes you see Him through the window as we're making the breads, and you, that extension of that creation of God and how vast it is, and we have all nature around us. And I can be making the bread and see Him there and look out the window and see Him there. It's a beautiful opportunity for prayer. In your 52 years as a religious sister, how many hosts do you think you've cut? Well, I don't know. It's, it's a, I would say it's almost like in, innumerable. <laughs> it's like a religious experience for me, really, to do this. Um, it's just like the Lord is right there with us. You know, he, he is, what we are doing is going to be his body and blood. And uh, for me, it's just like living in the presence of the Lord. Our days uh, are a mixture of prayer, of work, of recreation, and of solitude and leisure. Our days are centered around the Eucharist. All the time that we are working, we are praying in our heart and offering our work to God. It is such a beautiful life. It's not easy. But it is beautiful, and when you give your heart to Jesus, you're, you know, you just know who your spouse and he's going to take care of and he love you and you love him. It's just a life that cannot be compared to any other, really, in my estimation. What I appreciate most is the chance to pray, to be intimate with God, it, to let him love me. Nature's Welcoming Committee at St. Augustine House offered us instant tranquility. This monastic community in southern Michigan is the smallest in North America. You know, it's worth noting that St. Augustine House is in the Lutheran tradition. And can't be more than a half a mile down the road from here is a Roman Catholic monastery. And it's interesting that although both of these houses are in a different tradition of Christianity, their common heritage is St. Benedict. Also, it's worth noting that we're just moments away from the greater Detroit area. And with all the busyness of the city and the hustle and bustle and the noise, we come out here to a place where Father Richard Herbal tells us is a very unique way of life. People sometimes in their life need to get away and maybe this can be a place of quiet and peace where they can have various things healed in their life. In 1950, a successful businessman from Hudson's department store in Detroit began studying theology. A few years later, he was ordained as a Missouri Synod Lutheran priest. Father Arthur Kreinhater spent the rest of his life seeking monasticism. He founded this monastery in the late 50s. Comfortable accommodations, spacious retreat areas, tomes of religious literature, and traditional worship have attracted visitors for four decades. Some people might be attracted to the nature, the isolation, or the silence, or the liturgical prayer that goes on here. Uh, through all of that, I would hope they would come to a deeper sense of the presence of God uh, one monastic writer, he had an interesting uh, image that he used, and that was of a nuclear reactor. 
And uh, he said that when you visit a nuclear reactor, or perhaps a powerhouse, uh, he said even though you don't see the nuclear reaction or see any of the uranium or any of the actual things, yet he said everything that goes on around there is related to that. And you sense there is this mysterious fire mm. at the heart of this place that even though unseen, everything relates to it. And I, I think in a monastery, we would hope that everything that goes on here, the meals, the work, the prayer, somehow points to a mysterious fire that's at the heart and the center here, uh, wow. that people can become aware of that. Uh, Assumption Abbey is probably the most remote monastery in the United States. In the center of 3,400 wooded acres in the Ozark Mountains of Missouri, this is the home of 17 Trappist monks. For visitors, it's a warm and hospitable place with excellent accommodations and delicious meals cooked by the monks. Like many monasteries, Assumption Abbey asks its guests for nothing more than a free will offering. The Trappists here have a claim to fame. They're known around the world for their fruitcakes. They make 23,000 per year. Trappists lead a vigorous prayer life. The community rises at 3 a.m. and their prayers and works continue through the early evening. The Trappists count as their own the most famous monk of the 20th century, Thomas Merton. Merton was an intellectual of the world turned monk whose spiritual writings like The Seven Story Mountain have sold millions. Father James Connor, the abbot of this community, was a personal friend of Thomas Merton. They lived and prayed together for 18 years. In many times that, to my mind, one of the greatest graces of my life was the fact of having lived with him and under him and had him as a spiritual master and spiritual director. Thomas Merton described Father Connor as most holy and quiet, a constant consolation. We asked Father Connor what Merton's advice would be for today's seekers of peace and solitude. He would certainly encourage them in those aspects of their life because those were precisely the aspects that he sought most diligently he would realize the frenetic quality of life today. So he would encourage them certainly to be in touch with those elements of solitude and of silence and of prayer. And from that, to be able to come into touch with the deepest part of their own being, the deepest part of their own heart. As a teenager, Michael Jones' heart was drawn to the religious life, but he delayed his vocation for 32 years. During that time, he was a Marine and flew helicopters in Vietnam. Later, he enjoyed an adventurous career as a pilot. Then, at age 50, he came to Assumption Abbey. It's the most perfect lifestyle that I've ever run across. It's a very balanced uh, lifestyle. You get up at the same time in the morning, you go to bed at the same time in the evening, you pray at the same hours, you work at the same hours. It's very calm, but it's also a very hard life. Uh, it's it's uh, difficult getting up at three o'clock every morning some days, you know. But um, uh, it seems to suit me. If a person feels that they may be called in the contemplative direction, you're, you're never going to know unless you give it a try. You have to give it a try. And that was one of the reasons I, I came here, gave up a 27-year career and came here, is because I didn't want to go through the rest of my life wondering, you know, was I really called and I didn't answer God's call? So I'm here to find that out.
the miracle coming Can you believe it will take you away Where will be living my mom's there was death Where will be living in Jesus This is musical artist John Michael Talbot He was a folk rock virtuoso in the 1960s and is now the leader of a monastic community called the Brothers and Sisters of Charity. And can you believe there is charity coming? The only law now that we've come to obey. John there Michael, I know that your background is rock and roll. How do you get from rock and roll bands to Christian community? Well, in, in our, our, the music of Mason Prophet, which was the name of our band, we ask a lot of questions. We ask questions about, back in those days, the morality of things like the war in Vietnam, and then once you go to morality, you move to spirituality. So we begin asking a lot of questions, searching, and a uh, lot of hours on long bus rides on, on tours where you'd have to either get stoned or read. I chose to read. I would read, you know, political books, social books, and religious books. So it began a spiritual search that culminated in my really coming back to my Christian faith and then eventually going on to the Catholic faith. There will be in that Catholic faith sprang a community. Brother John Michael Talbot is the founder of this religious order. When he isn't touring, he lives with 40 brothers and sisters here at Little Portion Hermitage in northern Arkansas. Some of the members are celibate and others are married. The community offers a variety of retreats throughout the spring, summer, and fall. The Brothers and Sisters of Charity are a unique blend of Christian expressions. They borrow from St. Francis of Assisi, St. Benedict, and ancient desert monks. The community lives a simple life, growing most of their own food and trying to live in harmony with the environment. You might think that having a world-famous musician as a community leader, living in the midst of these beautiful surroundings, and having a great dog like Buster would make life perfect. But even the community has its own challenges. Little portion hermitage? We're just folks, you know, like, like folks out in the world. We're seeking God, yes, but we have all of our faults and failings that we're working on. A lot of people come here and say, oh, you guys live in heaven. No, when you, when you come to the monastery, you come to do battle. You come to do spiritual battle. And uh, eventually, I imagine, we will walk on cloud nine. But really, we start out battling ourselves. We find out how selfish we are. We get still so we can see all the stuff that's inside. It's tough, but it's worth it. It's tough, but it's good. My brain was wasted. I groaned all the day. There are also 400 people throughout the world who are committed to this community but live in their own homes. They're called domestics. Manny and Mercy Robles are elementary school teachers in Southern California. As domestics, their love for this way of life is growing. There isn't any room for them, even around the door. While he was delivering God's word to them, some people... As you get older, uh, you start to, to readjust your priorities. And I can see that, that the priorities that, that I am looking to now are lived out here a little portion. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. For my particular spirituality, this, this, is, this is what I need. For me, um, it was after a deeper conversion that I had uh, to Jesus. Uh, I just saw this as a way to even be closer to the Lord and, and to brothers and sisters. And I, I just... I just loved what brothers and sisters were. They just had that certain peace and look that I, I was searching for. 
And so I wanted to be part of that. We live in a very noisy society. So there's kind of a hunger for the silent, quiet things of life. And I think it's just humanity seeking what we know is the right thing that God has given us in the first place. We have to have some silence, then we can speak. you're not looking and if you're truly looking you're going to take time so people probably hear this a lot but you really just need to take time for prayer you need to take time to listen to be real still to be real quiet Well, it's been quite an adventure. We've seen a lot of different men and women and different lifestyles and different monasteries. But there's one more I'd like to see. I'm going to take my little video camera here and go visit a hermit. Hermits live in various degrees of extreme solitude, but to stay true to their beliefs, they are usually part of a monastic community. Early Christian hermits followed this pattern, living alone, but often worshiping in small groups on Sundays and holy days. Father Patrick McNulty leads a similar life. This is his hermitage in northern Ontario, Canada, where he spends most of his time in prayer. He also belongs to a Christian community called Madonna House, and spends part of his time performing more typical priestly duties. As a young man, Father McNulty worked as a parish priest in northern Indiana. He traveled annually to Cumbermere, Ontario, to spend time with the Madonna House family and make private retreats called Pustinia. He found himself spending more and more time here in northern Canada. But I've always been monastic. That's been my always been my desire. The family just sees that somebody is ready to go and live in Pustini and pray, pray for Madonna House, pray for the world, and so they say go. This has been Father McNulty's home for over 20 years. It's a one-room, 13 by 15 foot cabin. Everything is begged, nothing is bought. Most Pustinias have no electricity or running water. Father McNulty has some community responsibilities that require electricity. Although he's far removed from the typical world, his mind and heart are very close to it. We have to let go of being so technological. There's no space for God anymore. And God will get that space by one way or another. And I don't mean by condemning, but we'll either wear out or we'll, we'll overstuff ourselves or somehow God's going to get to our hearts. Then once we know... Once we really believe in God, then we know God is in charge in a very good, loving sense. But how the world gets to that, whoa. Uh, and I, suspo I suppose that's why some of us are doing what we're doing. My life in the Pustinia has always been fashioned around the Jesus prayer, in one way or another, in one form or another. Now it's just the name of Jesus. And I really believe my prayer of or cry for mercy from the Pustinia really brings down great just great mercy on the world
As we've seen in these stories, men and women from the ancient times to the present, from St. Anthony of the Desert to school teachers of today, still seek God and seek his peace. Now, everyone is welcome to visit these monasteries, and we've listed their phone numbers and ways to get in touch with them. Uh, there's no pressure whatsoever to participate in religious services, but you may want to check them out and see if one of these places would be a place for you to visit, to take a few days to rest. If you can't get to a monastery, by all means, take some time by yourself for prayer, for, for solitude, for silence. For if you seek God, you will surely find him. And when you find God, you will find peace. I'm Jim Murphy. May God's grace and peace and joy be with you today.